if we could continue to, to keep our gaze upon the gaze of Jesus. If I could encourage you just to, to take your eyes completely off of myself uh, and just put your eyes upon the eyes of, of Jesus in the image. And the word became flesh and dwelled among us, full of grace and truth. And we beheld his glory. Glory is the only begotten son of the Father. And we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being changed into his likeness from one degree of glory to another. From this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And to open, even though we just finished our prayer, I just want to open the, this little bit of time I have to share with you. Um, and I have to make a confession to you guys before I begin. I have no idea how to, to prepare a talk or to give a talk. Um, I didn't tell the sisters that before I accepted um, this invitation. Um, but what I really long to do today, uh, this privilege of, I mean, this is a Saturday. It's super beautiful out. Um, like, you guys are here. Like, that makes you family. Um, and there is a lot of, like, literally my family's here. The sisters are here. The Ma there's some Marians here. Some Marian missionaries are here. Like, you guys are family. And if I could just share my heart with you uh, as family, if that's okay. Um, so I'll begin with the cry I feel. If St. Faustina... Um, she is here, but if she is literally, if she pushed me out of the way and took the microphone, um, which I don't know if she would do, um, I believe that this would be her cry uh, to offer to you. Um, that will be our opening prayer for me offering you my heart. Faustina says, my Jesus, penetrate me through and through so that I might be able to reflect you in my whole life. Divinize me. So that, I, so that my deeds may have supernatural value. Grant that I may have love, compassion, mercy for every soul without exception. Oh my Jesus, each of your saints reflects one of your virtues. I desire to reflect your compassionate heart, full of mercy. I want to glorify it. Let your mercy, O oh Jesus, be impressed upon my heart and soul like a seal. And this will be my badge in this and the future life. Glorifying your mercy will be the exclusive task of my life. If St. Faustina was here and she could cry out, if she could offer you her heart, if, if you saw her alone before Jesus, not painted in the image, but him actually appearing to her, She'd be gazing at him and saying, Lord, transform me into yourself for you can do all things. Transform me into the love, the, the love that you are, the gaze that I see in your face, allow it to be mine. Everything about you, allow me to be fully transformed into that. Because she was a lover. And love longs for imitation. Love longs for imitation. If I believe, I believe I have a half hour, <laughs> as the sisters are going to give me the, the cutoff, um, if, I, if I could share anything, I think if, if whatever the world needs, whatever our church needs, whatever the pain and suffering that we're seeing on the news, what, the, what Faustina would be crying out and what I want you guys to be crying out, if, if you could hear what I am crying out, transform me into yourself. If we understood like the very reason that we are created is to reflect his love into the world, to reflect that love. And to start, I want to share a little story. A sister, Veritas, said, uh, at the beginning, I had a chance to live uh, homeless um, for, a few, for some time in my life, uh, which was one of the greatest privileges of, of my life. And uh, this homeless shelter I was sleeping at, um, that those who were running the shelter found out that I loved Jesus. So they said, hey, if you could give like a little Jesus talk every night before we go to bed or every night before we eat, that'd be great. Um, so every day I would just have this opportunity to share the gospel that, that, that God is like infinite love and he loves us not because we're worth it but because we deserve it. That, that he looks down upon us and delights to look at us. 
And every day, um, uh, many uh, men and women uh, would yell uh, and scream at me and tell me to shut up and to be quiet. Um, I'm glad that that hasn't happened yet thus far here. Um, and there was one particular day, there was a guy all the way in the back, and he was just screaming and, and saying, if you don't be quiet, I'm going to kill you after, this, uh, after the sharing. Uh, and I did what all of us would do, right? Especially the sisters. I continued to share the love of Jesus. And he continued to, to, to throw vile words at me um, and at the Lord during this time. And uh, as I finished, I, I realized I had probably three options uh, to this man. Um, first, I wanted to go up to him, but the, the options were first, like, how dare you? Kind of like give him the anger and say, like, you're interrupting everyone's time. Like, get, please don't come back. Or maybe like the second option would be shame, to, to, to make him really feel like unworthy to be there. Um, because it, like he wasn't forced to be there, right? Um, but I think the third option, which is the option uh, that our beautiful Jesus would have offered. I, I went up to him and said, what's your name? Can I eat a meal with you? Can I get to know you? And he said, sure, with very angrily. And uh, we sat down uh, across from the table from one another, and they served us our whatever, spaghetti and hot dogs or whatever we got. And um, I was like, tell me about yourself, because you don't want to know about me. I was like, I long to know about you. And he started telling me a little bit about his life, and he said, look at my shirt. It was like sprinkled with blood. He's like, look at my hands. There's blood all over his hands. That's not my blood. He started to go on and say that he was a local hitman or shock, whatever, the, the guy who did like the dirty business for the local gang, uh, the one that do the killing and the beating. So now I started taking his death threat a little bit, a little bit more serious. And, um, and I continued to listen to his story. And finally he looked at me and he said, and what are you doing here? Like, what's your motive? Like, why are you here? And I looked him in the eyes and said, because I love you. And tears started welling up in his eyes, and he, he like, basically screamed back at me, prove it. Prove it. Don't just talk about it. Don't just tell me about it. Prove it. And I felt at that moment, like in this, this brother, and we became brothers, and we actually, um, I'd see him in the streets of the, the city I was living in, and he'd have, you know, uh, work to do, right? And we'd actually, he'd allow me to pray over him. So the, the, the person that he was looking for wouldn't come by. Because for him to leave the gang is death. And we'd pray together that he wouldn't have to continue that work. We became friends, and when I left that city, we held each other and cried. Because love has, has um, a power that can transform enemies into friends. But in that moment, when he was crying, prove it, I saw Jesus. I saw Jesus in that man who wanted to kill me. And, and Jesus is saying, prove it. Prove it. And not in the sense of, like, prove that you're worthy, right? Like, a lot of times when we hear prove it, we think it's like, you know, get the merits. And then, no, prove as St. Paul would say, if I can find it, in Romans, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, uh, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God. That you may prove what is the will of God. St. Paul says, and your, your most holy will, which is love and mercy itself. St. Paul is saying, prove in your life who you know. Don't just like learn and, and talk about it. The evidence that you know the loving, merciful Jesus is that your life is a manifestation of that. Reveal it in your life. That man who is the shot caller, or whatever the word is, he was crying out, is Jesus in the least of these? Reveal it. Prove it. Jesus is crying out, not only in that man, but in everyone in this world. Looking at us, right? Like this is just like a little seed uh, in this ginormous city 
that we call Washington, D.C., looking at us and saying, prove it. In your life, don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers. To reveal love. To reveal love. To be that to the world. To be light in the darkness. Um, there's many, many years of my life, if you told me that, I had better things to do. I, I was not listening. I was not caring. I wasn't wanting to be an image of, of Jesus in the world. I wanted to be uh, the image of the American dream, right? Um, which I'm sure um, this is like the hotbed for the image of the American dream, right? Like wealth, health, making it, being the best, climbing the ladder. And I did that. And I did that, as Sister said, in sports. And I got to the level uh, of the NFL, got to the highest level of that game, spent most of my young life working and giving my life to the sport. And I got to the very top, and I was so unfulfilled. I got to the top of the ladder in that. Everything that the world could offer, I had it. I was so unfulfilled. And in those moments when that, that emptiness, I know a lot of times we, we know that emptiness feeling, right? Um, whether if it's like pressure put onto us by anyone. And even in the church, right? Like we can climb the, the ladder within the church. Not, it's not just the corporate ladder. Be, be, be known and respected. We, we can climb that ladder. And one thing I realized when I got to the top of the ladder, like Jesus was at the lower rung the entire time. And ever since that moment of realizing that, it's just been like a downward mov- movement. Of long, like Jesus says, like even though he, or St. Paul says, even Jesus, though he was in the form of God, he did not deem equality with God something to be grasped, but he emptied himself. I mean, look at that, the image of his heart. He emptied himself. We're called to empty ourselves. And this beautiful journey, this amazing journey, of just like longing, as is, is I read, to like gaze upon this image and recognizing like when we gaze upon this image, something happens spiritually that we're being transformed into that image. And that, that journey led me to like divest myself of like longing to empty myself of all things and living as a hermit, uh, which is what we all do in our mid-twenties, right? Um, living as a hermit for three years in the middle of the uh, of Texas. And, and I feel like the gift, if I could share something, like the gift that the Lord gave me in those three years was like a love for Him, like intimate time with Him, um, but specifically like in the Word, in the Bible. I, I had a superior over me, and he said, As long as you're living as a hermit, the only thing you're allowed to read um, was not the diary of St. Faustina, but the Gospels. You know, this is like, I'm in my mid-twenties, I have nothing other than my backpack, and I'm like longing to give my life to the Lord, and my superior said, you don't know Jesus. Like, what do you mean? Like, I'm following you, I'm giving you everything. He's like, you don't know Jesus. It's like, encounter the living God. And I did, slowly. I mean, (laughs) I have no no idea what I'm even talking about, and I'll be the first one to acknowledge that. But I started to fall in love with Jesus of Nazareth. I started seeing how he was revealed in the Gospels, his tenderness, his love, his goodness, and that he was not locked up in the desert with walls around him, that he longed to be the good shepherd, to go and find the lost one. He longed to be the good physician that that comes to heal those who are sick. I fell in love with that man, and I realized the only logical thing for me to do is to follow him. The only logical thing to do. And, and that's, what, that's what he offers. When we encounter him, are you for me or you're against me? Follow me. Follow me. And not to be like some religious, like self-right. Follow his love, his pattern of love. Where does he go? Why is he light entering into the darkness of the image? And I had the gift of, of leaving the hermitage and started living in the same streets that I played professional football in. Um, this time not in the front page of the newspaper, but kind of as a nobody and as a reject. 
And that was the greatest gift. I choose that every day. And one thing I realized that living homeless in the streets is like, our country is very generous. I had the gift of spending most of the day today um, with the homeless community here by uh, Union Station. I, I got fed really well. <laughs> I, I ate many sandwiches, and um, my stomach was full of peanut butter and jelly uh, many times. Um, we're very generous, right? Like, in our country, we're so generous uh, to, towards everyone. Um, we give food, we give clothing, we give housing, we give shelters, we give... But we don't give, like, 10 minutes of our time. Like, Jesus doesn't just come to do something for us. Like, he comes to be with us. Like, we're about to go to adoration. I will not leave you. Love as I love you. Jesus never said, go do a bunch of stuff. And I realized that the cry of the poor, which is all of us in this room and all of humanity, the cry of humanity is not that we're hungry for food, but that we're hungry for love. Not that, we've been, not that we need clothing, but so many of us, I mean, this is like young adults, like we've been stripped of our, of our dignity by many different things people taking advantage of us, people pushing us, people telling us what we need to become. Like, we've been stripped of our dignity. And it's not like there's a lack of housing and shelters. There's a lack of community and family and love. And that the call, I felt like, by living these experiences in the streets is like, for us as, as followers of Jesus, is not to go out and just th this mindset of like, um, of food, right? Which is good, we need to eat but of like, how can we encounter someone and give them the love that they're crying out for, that we know, that we know they're crying out, prove it. Don't just tell me that you go to this church or you're part of this young adult group. Reveal that you're a part of, of him, that you've encountered the living God and your life has been transformed. Don't think about just like, how can we clothe and like offer material things? How can we encounter someone? Like really get to know them reveal to them how beautiful they are, how precious they are. Reveal to them, like, if they could see as you see, like, they would be so happy. Jesus says, like, the light of the body is the eye, and if your eye is clear, like, your whole body be full of light. Whatever that means, right? Like, he's saying, if how you see, like, if you can see as he sees, if your, light, if your eye is light, your whole body will be the light in the world. Like, look at the image. Like, look how he's looking. And not just to, like, figure out how to provide shelter, but how can we create family? How can we bring love and family and community in places that it's never been? And that might be in your own home. That might be in your own classroom. That might be at your own workplace, right? Like, I'm not saying that's all me at Union Station tomorrow morning. We, ha we have those places in our lives. We have those people in our lives. We are also a part of that. So I, I feel like the Lord, like, he led me on this, this school of love that I'm just, like, still trying to enroll in. But getting to the key of, like, who Jesus is and what that love looks like. And as I was meditating... In preparation, his sister also mentioned that it's like Corpus Christi, right? Like, I think sometimes uh, I'm really bad because I don't know how to give talks. And I don't know how to, like, like I'm just, like, very up here, and I don't know how to, like, um, which is just my thing, and I don't even know what I'm saying right now. But um, the gospel reading for Corpus Christi, like, it, I, I attempted to go to Mass before this and it didn't work out, but, um, like, he saw the people that were hungry. Like Jesus saw that there's 5,000 people and they're hungry. And one of the gospel readings said that he was moved to compassion. And, he, and he, he told his disciples, go give them something to eat, right? And, and it says that, well, we have nothing, right? Like, and I feel like a lot of times we feel like, who, like, what do I have to give, right? The greatest gift is Jesus, but like we are the gift to be given. 
And, and it said that he took the bread, he blessed the bread, he broke it, and he gave it. And I feel like the word compassion, like he had compassion on them. It's not just like he felt sorry or even had like mercy. Like in Greek, it means like his gut was like wrenched. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen something on TV or something in our own life where like something bad happened and you're just like, like you feel it here. Like that's the compassion. He's like, they have nothing to eat. They're crying out. And I think in the world today, of course they need the Eucharistic Jesus. You know, Corpus Christi, the body of Christ. But also I'm looking at the body of Christ. Like the world's crying out for you. And like you're the gift. And sometimes that's the hardest thing to realize. The greatest thing you can give is your time, your attention, your love, your personality, everything that God has created you to be. Because Jesus didn't come just to give us mercy. He is mercy and he gave, him, gave us himself. And I think as I'm looking at these movements, of like re- recognizing that Jesus, I mean, I don't have to speak on like what's going on if you turn on the news, whether if it's in politics or in the church, right? Like Jesus is crying out with compassion. Like his gut is wrenched. Like he is suffering because he longs for you to be his image in this world. And he longs to take you and to bless you, and to break you, and to give you. He longs to to take you. Like this is where we're getting ready for adoration. Like he longs, for him to take us is not like, like look how beautiful he is, look how gentle he is. He's not rough, he's like, come to me all you who labor and are burdened and I will give you rest. Like, how many of us need rest right now? Of, like, the chaos, the busyness, the rushing. He's like, come to me. And, and like, what is our position in, in the arms of Jesus? Like, to, to lay on, his, on him, just rest with him. Like, do we have that personal prayer time every day? Just to rest with him. Not to, like, do our prayers and prayer chaplets and read the Bible. Like, just rest with him. He longs for that intimate time with us, for him him to take us to himself, to be a refuge, to be a refuge for us. Like he longs to become that refuge for us, Uh, to bless us, right? Like not only is this amazing, beautiful God, like he sees us individually and like come to me, but he wants to like speak truth to us. And a lot of times the voices that we hear is that we're not good enough, that, that we're ugly, that we're not talented enough, that we're not making enough money, that we're not funny enough, like we're not good, like we're worthless, right? A lot of my friends, like sometimes they, they feel, and I feel like this sometimes, like the very existence of my life is a pain to other people. Like that's the voice of, of the evil spirit because he longs to make us feel unworthy. But Jesus, he doesn't see us as like, as sinners, like when he was on the cross, he wasn't like you, you, you poor wretches, like you sinners, like I'm, I have to do this for, he was like, I love you. Like I see what you've been created to be before the foundation of the world. Like you're created to be my image and likeness, I love you. Allow me to take death to give you life. When he speaks to us, in the Gospel of John it says everything, like the spirit will give you everything that he's given to me. I, I, that's a total paraphrase. When Jesus came forth from the waters, the Spirit spoke for, out of, from God the Father, like, you are my beloved in whom I'm so well pleased. Like, do we recognize that the blessing that Jesus longs to give us is, is to call us who we truly are? Now what all the voices say, that I love you. You're... Even like we're like, like we're the small seed, right? And there's a few of us here. And we feel like we have to do the work, right? And like we have to be the lovers. Like I spent most of my Christian life being like, I have to be the lover. I have to do it and I'll love him like no one else. Jesus is like, I want you to be the beloved. Like allow me to love you. Like you've been created to be a capacity to just receive his tenderness. Like that's why you exist. 
And I don't have time to go into scripture and, and to, real, to show that to you. But that you're the beloved. Have we heard him say that? Not Eric, not the sisters, not in homilies. Have we heard Jesus say, you are my beloved. And I'm so pleased in you. As we were being held by him. Break, right? Okay, no one wants that one. Um, he takes us, he blesses us, he breaks us. When I think of break, I don't think, remember, because the, the understanding of, the only way we can understand who God is is through the man, Jesus, the God man. Like I have to, all my, everything who God is, I have to understand through how he's revealed him. And believe me, he is not one just to break us. But it says in Romans 8, verse 29, that before the foundation of the world that we have been predestined to be conformed into the image of the Son. That in, in the mind of God, when he was, before, before, in the beginning, before page one of this beautiful book, that in his mind, he created humanity should be a reflection of Jesus. And we know what that reflection is. Because like John tells us, that, that God is love. And not love that we've been told, but, but this is love, that, that he laid down his life for us. So we know that before the foundation of the world, that we've been created to be the image and likeness of God who is love, self-giving love, unconditional love. So I realize like in our life, there's so many times where like, People, like, is there, either if it's at work or with family or, I mean, not my family, right? Um, work or family or at school or whatever, trying to get here and there's traffic. Like, there's so many circumstances that can just, like, irritate us. Or do we allow that to be like, Lord, someone's treating me bad. Allow me to be your compassion to them. Lord, someone's lied to me. Allow me to be your forgiveness. Like seeing like everything in life is conforming us, right? Like, like breaking us, but like not just to break us to put into pieces on the side, but to conform us to be love. Like there's nothing that can happen in our day that can, can stop us from being love. And like how often is our prayer to like change someone else? Lord, make them res- like understand something different or my boss is hard. Like if he keeps doing this, I'm gonna have to treat him. Like no, like... Lord, allow me to be your love in every situation. Imagine like if we woke up in the morning knowing that the very reason of our existence is to be the reflection of Jesus into the world. You don't have to have people treat you good to have a good day. It doesn't have to be a sunny day out to be a beautiful day. You exist to be his love and you know that. You know it because like he's taken you to himself and he has told you who you are. And his love is unconditional. It means there's no conditions. Like how often we put conditions. Like Jesus says he, he doesn't even have the concept of condition. Like he loves all of humanity. I remember I used to have this definition of mercy or love, of like loving the unlovable. In Jesus' eyes, there's no one who is unlovable. We put those conditions, like, like, oh, this is an unlovable person, so I'm going to like be self-righteous and like love this person. No, they are lovable because they've been created to be Jesus and they're beautiful. Like, do we have that vision? Have no conditions. Or I'll, like, I'll give you my time because I'm expecting something back. Like, how many friends do we have that are like that? Like, how many friends do we have in our life that I love you for the sake of yourself? Like, if we become a church like that, like, there will be light in the darkness. Love is self-giving. <laughs> um... Love is self-giving. So often we want to do things, right? Like this is America, we do. But recognizing that because we are the beloved, like wrestle with Jesus and allow him to to, tell you that you're the gift to be given to another person. Self-giving love. Give yourself your time. The world is crying out, prove it. And that's the last to be given. He, take, he takes us to himself. Because remember, we long to be the body of Christ. We long to be the, oh. <laughs> we long to be the body of Christ. We long to be his embodiment into the world. 
where people, when they see us, they see him. Like how God longs to work in the world is not like lightning bolts. Like are we willing to be the answer to our prayers? When we see injustice going on, when we see pain and war and like division, are we willing not just to pray about it, but to allow the Lord to say, you are my embodiment, go. Be the love in those places that are painful. So he takes us, he blesses us, we are the beloved. He conforms us into the image. Then we can be given. I long to be a part of a church that looks like him. Because that's what we're created to be. The embodiment of Jesus. And we know what that is, is love and mercy itself. And not a love that we create, but a love that looks like the cross. The love that looks like after, the, after his crucifixion, he comes in the upper room offering peace and blessing. The church is called to become that love that lays down its life for others. There was a time when the church was scandalous because of the love. There's times when there'd be sickness that'd break out into a community and everyone would leave and the Christians and the Catholics would stay and care for the sick. It was scandalous. How can they love those people? All the leper colonies throughout the world. How can those sisters and those priests and those Catholics stay there? That's scandal. Let's be that scandal of love. Not a scandal of selfishness. A scandal of love. And they can come up to the, why do you do what you're doing? Jesus. Like that's our call. We get to become the church that we long to see. We get to become the church that we get to gaze upon. I invite all of us in this time of adoration to allow the Lord to take you to himself. Allow the Lord to like really speak truth to you. Speak to him. Allow him to like tell you what he really thinks of you. He loves you. You're, you're so beautiful. Where can, there's parts of our life that we need to be conformed a little bit. Where we can wake up in the morning and know that person that's always on my nerves is really the person I'm called to be the revelation of God's love to and forgiveness to and give myself to. And where is our prayer and our petitions that we wrote at these ba- in this basket? Like, how can we be the answer to those prayers? Um, I love you guys. Um, I long to be a part of a church that is love. Amen.